for the longest time, we've known DNA was composed of four nucleotides. Okay, we've known that since the early half of the 19th century. Okay. We weren't sure until the mid-50s with Watson and Crick exactly the structure of DNA, but we knew its components. What was the stumbling block for a lot of biologists was how can four nucleotides, four letters, give you the required information to pick and choose which of 20 amino acids should be linked together to form a protein. How do you go from four letters to 20 amino acids? And that's part of the reason why they had such a trouble, you know, for a long time, especially in the early 19, you know, in the early 1900s, you know, accepting the idea that DNA could be storing the information. Four letters. How many words can you make with only four letters? How can you make full sentences, full instructions to make you with only four letters? Whereas proteins that were there in the chromosome had 20 amino acids. I could write quite a bit with only 20 letters. Not sure how much I could do, how much I could get across with only four. What they were able to figure out was that there are some set rules. Central dogma, DNA transcribed to RNA, that messenger RNA is not going to be read letter by letter, A, G, C, U. Remember, no T's, RNA has no T's, it only has U's. A, G, C, U's. So how do you go from AGCUs strung together as a messenger RNA to get a protein? Well, what they figured out through a series of experiments was that the messenger RNA is read three nucleotides at a time. They call it a triplet code. Three, three nucleotides, three nucleotides, three nucleotides, three nucleotides. Those three nucleotides are called a codon. The codons do not overlap. They butt up against each other. Nucleotides 1, 2, 3, codon 1. Nucleotides 4, 5, 6, codon 2, and so on and so forth. So what you end up with when you look at the central dogma, gene 3, will be copied, transcribed in during translation, DNA to RNA. Here's the DNA, and then you get a messenger RNA. Notice template, non-template. Template will be read, the non-template is the the strand that will be mirrored, or that will be the Xerox copy. C and A, add a U. C and C, add a G. G, A, 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 U, U, U. Ribosomes are going to come and read three at a time. The triplet code. Whoa, that went way off. The triplet code. So that triplet code, three at a time, three at a time, codon by codon, is how we go from, we translate from nucleic acid to amino acid. The template strand is what will be read. Okay, so the double helix, two strands running anti-parallel. Which strand is template, which strand is non-template, non will be different 
gene to gene. That's a, so, that's a weird thing for many students to get their head, minds around. Okay, for gene A, the left-hand strand is template, right-hand strand is non-template. For gene B, right is template, left is not. Gene C, don't know, either one. D, F, G, the same thing. So it may bounce back and forth for a whole string of genes, one after another. It could be the same strand as template. There is a specificity. There are things within the structure of the DNA that will say, that will state, this is template, this is non-template. Um, when you get into genetics with Dr. Albee your senior year and discuss it like that, you'll see it has to do with methylation of one strand over the other will indicate, you know, how enzymes bind, where they bind, what orientation they bind in, which will then correspond to which strand's template, which strand is non-template. Thing to keep in mind, when you're reading the messenger RNA, you start at the five prime end and you move to the three prime end, okay? Five prime end, that's where the phosphate is. Okay, so remember we're talking about the sugars. Phosphate, sugar, three prime end, next phosphate for next nucleotide, sugar, three prime end, so on. Just like for us of uh, European descent, which it could be contrary to other countries, we read left to right. Some countries read right to left. Some other countries read top down. Okay? No matter what, when it comes to reading the messenger RNA, you read five prime end to three prime end. So we have a bunch of codons. When you do the math, four codons to the third power, four times four is 16, 16 times four is 64. 64 possible nucleotide sequences. Through lots of mutation studies, looking at mutants, trying to determine in a test tube when you link together certain sequences of nucleotides, what will the resulting amino acid sequence be? Researchers were able to determine that of the 64 possible nucleotide sequences in the codon, 61 of them correlated directly with an amino acid. Three of them were what is referred to as stop signals. They did not code for an amino acid. They coded for the termination of translation. Sixty-one possible triplets, sixty-one possible codons, only 20 amino acids. So that means there's going to be overlap. They refer to this as redundant. Some amino acids may only have one codon that codes for them. Others, four, five. But there's no ambiguity. If you list out a sequence of three nucleotides as the codon, AGU, AGU will only correspond to serine, 
as you see right here. AGU. Whoa. AGU will only give you serine. Okay. AGU will not call for anything else. Redundant, but not ambiguous. Another thing that we have learned early on and is very important, something we'll talk about a little while in a few many lectures from now, what happens if you do not read in the correct orientation? Or you do not read the correct triplet for codon 1, for codon 2, codon 3. If you do not start with nucleotide 1, 1, 2, 3, codon A, 4, 5, 6, codon B, if you shift it, co nucleotides 2, 3, 4, codon A, nucleotides 5, 6, 7, codon B, what you have done is you have frame shifted. You have now shifted the view, how you've oriented, and you will get, I mean, you could still get a string of amino acids, but they're an incorrect string of amino acids that will not generate a working protein. It's a protein that will not fold correctly, will not have the correct shape, no shape, no function. Now, what's interesting is the genetic code is universal. All things on this planet use the same genetic code. It's one of the pillars for evolution. You pick anything, any bacteria, any plant, any animal, hell, any virus on this planet. We all use, in our DNA, A, G, C, T. In our messenger RNA, A, G, C, U. Our triplets, read as codons, the codon table on the previous slide is pretty much the same for all organisms. I say pretty much because uh, there is a difference. Prokaryote, eukaryote, they formulate they're methionine, we don't, but it's still the same codon calling for methionine. All living things use not only the central dogma, but the same nucleotides, the same codon, table, everything. Because of that, we can swap genes. You look on the left there, that's a tobacco plant that is expressing luciferase. Luciferase is the enzyme that makes fireflies' butts glow. You have a glowing tobacco plant because a scientist took that luciferase gene from a firefly and inserted that gene into an embryonic plant. On the right, you have a glow-in-the-dark mosquito larvae. Why is it glowing? Because it has a jellyfish gene in it. Some jellyfishes glow. It's a different gene setup than the luciferase from the firefly. But still, you can do this. Now, it's not just plants and insects. Luciferase gene has been put in pigs. Yeah, think about that. Glow-in-the-dark bacon. Gotta love science.